Hey, she sparklers. <laughs> this is Beth Shadler hosting today our speaker meeting with Carrie Briner all the way in Idaho. Are you in Idaho? Okay, mm -hmm. that's right. Yes, she is super inspirational. She empowers people um, to do their very best and remove roadblocks in their path. Um, she was awarded what top female business coach that was empowering. And what was the official title? I don't that know. Was, that was it a was long one. Accolade. That was a long one. There was a good, it was a good accolade. It was one of like, you know, the top coaches in the country. And I think it did have something to, it was female coaches and that was great. Um, and that was a couple of years ago. Okay. But she knows what she's talking about. And we're like, <laughs> we want to hear what she has to say. So welcome, Carrie. Thank you Yay. so much for joining us. And um, let's rock and roll. Go Perfect. for it. Yeah. So um, are all of the uh, lovely ladies in here in real estate or in other uh, businesses yes. as well? We are all in real estate. We have, what, three to five years uh, average experience in real estate. We're go-getters. We really are passionate. We care. We want to be better. Um, yeah, that's where we are. And we're part of a women's group called She Spark Society. And this is I part of the it. that we provide. That's and we're awesome. brokerages. We're broker agnostic. Awesome. Perfect. I love it. I have a broker agnostic co-working space space and co-working uh, center and coaching and training center here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, which is the panhandle of Idaho. If anybody hasn't been here, you should Google it. I didn't know about it before I met my husband. Uh, it would then people started saying to me, oh my gosh, you're going to Coeur d'Alene. That's a bucket list item. And I'm like, what? I don't even know where Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is. And it is a beautiful destination area. We have lots and lots of tourists uh, that come during uh, different times of the year, but it basically looks like Montana because we're about 90 miles from Montana, 90 miles from Canada and about 30 miles from Washington. Uh, and it's beautiful. God's country. I like to call it. We're surrounded by lakes and mountains and wildlife and it's very peaceful. Um, and the city of Coeur d'Alene is a blast. Um, it still feels a little small town, but lots of moving and shaking. And we are one of the top areas people are moving to right now, actually still, which is interesting. So um, yeah. So if you ever come to Coeur d'Alene, you have to look me up so that we can hang out. I always tell people that because I always find people go, oh yeah, we are going to take a vacation there. So look up, look me up if you do, so you can come see me. Uh, and uh, so I love uh, working with entrepreneurs in general uh, for many, many years. It's been real estate agents because I've been a realtor since I was 23 years old. So now over half of my life, um, uh, 24 years and going strong. Um, I sold uh, a lot of real estate. I raised my boys while I did it. I didn't have a great quality of life for many of those years that I was selling, which led me into uh, a leadership opportunity. And I really wanted to help people have a better quality of life while they sold real estate. And I really immersed myself into team building and I helped to grow about a hundred real estate teams across the country in the course of about 12 years um, after I sold real estate. Um, I also started my own coaching company with a business partner. And that's where, uh, you know, the accolade that Beth shared uh, came from. We uh, coached about 500 realtors a year across the country, all, all brokerages. We also started to coach people in different industries. And that's where I got really excited about just helping people who are entrepreneurs or small business owners in general. I still really have a soft spot in my heart for real estate because it has done a lot of great things for my life and my family. And I've been in it again, over half my life. So it's all I know, but I also just know that entrepreneurs and small business owners in general struggle with all the same things. And uh, so when we can start to surround ourselves with people who are doing what we're doing and that really are in alignment with us and su are supportive and collaborative and really want to help one another, we all have success and grow. And that's what we're really fostering here in our new co-working space and coaching center, which now has, um, six different real estate brokerages participating in it, about 80 or 85 realtors, as well as about 15 other industries uh, represented. So we have about 115 members already, and we just opened it in March. And the reason I say that is because what I think is awesome is that it's attracting people that also realize that we can come from an abundant mindset. We don't have to come from a scarcity mindset. We can actually help each other, whether we're in the same brokerage or not, or whether we're in the same industry or not. And even if we're direct competitors, if we think of ourselves as collaborators, we're both going to win because there's plenty of opportunities and plenty of business to go around. So, um, I, you know, I live my life in a, a philosophy that abundance is all around us. Scarcity is just something that's a figment of our imagination. We all have enough. And there's plenty to go around. And those of us that collaborate are going to get most of what there is. So with that being said, I love what Beth has done here and what you guys are doing because it's right up my alley. So I wanted to talk about something um, 
just really briefly that I've been talking to a lot of my coaching clients and business partners with uh, about lately. And I would love some feedback or, you know, some conversation around it. I'm going to keep it as short and sweet as I can so that we can have conversation, but it's, um, it's around the, um, idea of procrastination because I found that that has been one of the biggest challenges for, um, for entrepreneurs in general. And of course, for the realtors that I've coached or that I'm partnered with is this idea of knowing what to do, but not actually doing it. Um, and knowing that we're not doing it, but not really understanding why we're not doing it. And uh, it's a real frustrating cycle when we know that if we just do A, B, C, and D, we're going to make the money we want, yet we're not doing A, B, C, and D, and we can't figure out why. And oftentimes we think that procrastination and we've been taught this, and I even coached this way for many years because it's what everybody thought, which is it's really just a problem with time management or priority management. Like we're just not prioritizing prioritizing the important things. We're not, uh, you know, we're not time managed enough, and we're just not getting to those things that we need to do. Other things are getting in the way. And the reason why we think that is because oftentimes if we talk to ourselves or we talk to others about why we think we're procrastinating something, the, the general response is, well, this happens and then this happens and this comes in and then I just get to the end of the day and I didn't do it. So it seems like it's a time management or a priority management issue. And so we try to go solve the procrastination problem by helping ourselves get better at those two things. But what I realized over many years is that we can break down a calendar and we can actually write down the priorities and we're still not doing the things we need to do. So it can't just be that. Now, I do believe it's partially that because we do have to uh, we do have to adhere to some sort of schedule. We do have to clarify in our own minds what's important. Otherwise, we're going to do everything because everything's going to seem important, right? So those things are important, but they can't be the only thing. Otherwise, there'd be a lot more people actually doing and a lot less people procrastinating, and that's just not the truth. So I started to do some research, and I've always kind of been a little bit of a psychology nerd, partly because I went through 10 years of selling real estate, making a lot of money, and really having uh, a horrible life. And I realized that a lot of it was my own doing, even though I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, it was a lot of subconscious uh, things that were happening in my life. And I was allowing my mind to really control my life. And in fact, believing that my mind was my life and having my subconscious really direct me into areas that were not good for me. And um, so I really became fascinated with the mind. And first and foremost, I did it because I wanted to heal myself and I wanted to have my own personal transformation, but I brought a lot of it into my coaching. And so when I, when I started reading more about procrastination, I came across an article that really was a huge aha for me. And I've been sharing it with people and they've really had some great aha. So I'm hoping it will help you guys too. But it, it's this concept of you really neuroscience based approach to getting more stuff done instead of just saying, well, follow your calendar, but really like what happens in our brain. And, and, and what they're saying is, is that it really isn't that support time management, the real culprit behind procrastination is uh, mood and emotion management. So we procrastinate to manage our moods and to manage our feelings and our emotions. And so when I heard that, I thought, oh my gosh, that's so true because typically we are avoiding or procrastinating things that are not that fun to do. Um, and so what we are doing is our brain is telling us, no, you don't like to do that. That's not fun. That makes you uncomfortable. That makes you feel like a failure because you're not that good at it yet. That, that is not something that's enjoyable. So don't do that. And so although we don't hear those words in our brain, our brain triggers something in us that makes us want to find other things to do to be able to have an excuse to procrastinate something that we don't want to do. So it has nothing to do whether if it's on our calendar or not, or if we know it's a priority not or not, it has to do with our brain helping us to regulate our mood and our emotions. And so what's also very fascinating about that is typically when we avoid doing something we don't want to do, we replace the time with something we like. Because our brain in that moment is like, oh, but you like to do this. So go make the Canva image instead. That'll help you. Go post that on social media and instead of call those people. And so you actually train yourself and create a vicious cycle of rewarding a bad behavior, which is to avoid something you don't like. So not only are you avoiding it, you're now actually saying, when I don't do the things I don't want to do, I actually get to do something I like doing. And we're training ourselves to be more procrastinators. 
So it was fascinating to me because I thought, holy cow, I could name probably five things that I do exactly for that reason and in that way right now if I if I wrote them down. So there's two parts of the brain, just to get a little bit more sciencey. There's two parts of the brain. The first one is the limbic system, and that's the one that is responsible for our immediate emotional responses. And the prefrontal cortex, which if you've gone to any sort of real estate or sales training, they talk about this one all the time which is basically involved in decision-making and in planning. So when we're telling people plan better, write down your priorities, get it in your calendar, it's this prefrontal cortex we're telling them to exercise. However, the problem with that is, is that the short-term mood regulation that happens from the limbic system is far stronger in our brain than the prefrontal cortex. Therefore, it doesn't matter how much we exercise the front part of our brain, the limbic system is always going to override that because it's much, much stronger. So the reality is, is it's not, a, the good news, you guys, is that you are not failing in managing of your time. You are just basically succumbing to an emotional response. And you're, you, and that's okay because we're human beings. But now that you know that, then you can do something with it, right? And so once we understand that there's this tug of war happening in our own brains, then we can actually develop some better effective strategies for overcoming procrastination. So the first one is harnessing dopamine because this is like the concept of, I've, re I've read other books before, like the, the pleasure principle. So one strategy is like leveraging our brain's reward system. Dopamine, the so-called pleasure chemical, right? That plays the central role here. That's what I'm talking about when we say no to our lead generation and say yes to, to making something in Canva because we have fun making something in Canva. We're rewarding ourselves, whether we know it or not, for procrastinating something else, because we all of a sudden raise the dopamine in our brain, and it's actually an addictive thing that happens. We will become addicted to feeling more positive, and we can start to recognize what makes us feel that way. And so, um, but there's something more specific that we can actually kind of create a hack because there is... Within dopamine, more specifically, it's the anticipation of a reward. So when we accomplish a task, we feel good, partly because our brain releases dopamine in anticipation of the benefits, but also that means we can create situations in our brain that are going to release that same chemical, fostering that same sense of reward, right? So the strategy is called dopamine hacking, where we create little rewards for tasks that we need to, to do. And this could be honestly uh, a break to go walk the dogs, to um, you know go shopping, to go for a short walk outside that are basically split between focused work. And that's why you've heard lots of coaches and people say, like do bursts of things. The problem with just choosing to do bursts is that if you just say, oh, if I work like here, then I'm going to go for a walk. If the walk isn't a reward, you're not going to create that dopamine while you're doing the thing you don't want to do. So you have to think strategically about it. What's going to make me feel good so that I can put that right at the end of this 20 minute call session so that in the anticipation of that reward, my dopamine is actually going to raise in my brain and I'm going to feel better. And I'm going to be more motivated to actually move into my lead generation. I actually used to do some of the tasks I didn't like door knocking and some of the things when I was a realtor and I would go shopping after it. And I would tell myself I was going to, because I loved shopping. I didn't even have to buy anything. I just love the act of shopping. I always have. I love looking at clothes and shoes and all the things. Of course, I probably ended up buying something, but uh, if I knew I had to do this all, and I would do it for a few hours and it would be something that I just really wasn't looking forward to, but I'd committed to doing, I would literally know that what was going to happen right after that. So I was doing this occasionally. I didn't really realize what I was doing, but it made sense to me because I did get myself into those actions because I had something to look forward to after. But the other thing is we have to stop the self-reinforcing cycle of procrastination. So when you find yourself moving towards a decision to not do your lead generation or not do your calls or not do whatever it is that you don't like to do, you have to stop yourself from choosing something you like to do instead. Because if you can't stop doing that, what's going to happen is you're just going to continue to train your brain that when you say no to this thing, you get what you want. We want to do the exact opposite, right? So it's two things. It's 
figuring out how to give yourself those rewards to raise the dopamine and also stop giving yourself rewards when you procrastinate. Both of those create a bunch of problems and will be more likely that you're going to continue to procrastinate in the future if you can't stop the cycle. But the reality is, is that there's another hack, and this was really interesting. I have a couple of my coaching clients working on this, is reframing your discomfort with a magic phrase. And this is from sci scientists who've watched and mapped the brain. And when people use different words, they can actually see different parts of their brain light up, right? And that's because words that we say actually make us feel a certain way and create different transmitters and neurotransmitters in our brain at different times. And different parts of our brain will light up when we're talking about or thinking about certain things. So words, you've heard this before, words matter more than you know, what you say out loud, what you say to yourself, literally make you feel a certain way, which is going to be in direct proportion to how you act or not act. And it's going to be in direct proportion, therefore, to the results of your life or your business. But we don't always take the, the words as seriously as we should, in my, in my opinion. I've literally seen people just start saying different words and literally have changed the face of their business because they were saying things that were literally perpetuating exactly what they didn't want. And the second they realized that and became aware of it and started changing the words, they started to actually change what they got because they changed what they did because they changed their feelings because it all started with the words that entered their brain. So you can actually create some dopamine releases by using certain words. And so one of the most effective strategies that they were talking about in this article to combat procrastination lies in people's ability to reframe that discomfort that they have associated with that task. And so when you have the urge to procrastinate, because it stems from our emotional reaction to an anticipated pain or discomfort, if we can change our perception of the discomfort and turn it into a driving force, and we can release dopamine and we can get ourselves to do it. And the phrase that they use, which I have some of my coaching clients using right now and giving me some pretty interesting feedback is, this is the good work. Sounds super simple, but the phrase has the power to fundamentally shift our perspective in that moment. And more importantly, what they saw is internal chemistry of our brain. So when you encounter a task that feels super overwhelming or unappealing and you feel the urge to procrastinate it or push it off, just pause for a moment and acknowledge the discomfort. First of all, acknowledge that you don't like to do it. Stop pretending like you do and making an excuse that something else is coming in the way. Just tell you, just acknowledge the reality. I don't like doing this task. If you acknowledge it, but then you say to yourself, and I would encourage it to be out loud, unless you're sitting around people who will think you're crazy. Um, this is the good work. So even though I don't like it, it's the good work. And the reason that they said that they did that is because um, the reframing the discomfort does two things. Number one, it acknowledges the reality, which is that we don't like doing it. Work can be challenging and that's okay. We don't have to like everything. Not all tasks are enjoyable. Um, and discomfort is also a sign that we're pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone, which we know logically, but in the moment we don't care, right? We just don't want to do it. It also aligns the task with your goals and your values. When you refer to the task as the good work, you remind yourself that it is a task, even if it's difficult or unenjoyable, that is valuable and is meaningful. And it's part of the work that you need to do to achieve your goals and to fulfill your responsibilities and fulfill your dreams, honestly. And so there's something that when you say that, it attaches that into your brain. Like naturally, that's what you will think and what you will feel. But they said something that was so interesting because there was like this really fascinating neuroscience angle to this, which is that when you reframe the task in this way, it literally does trigger this dopamine release. And because you're no longer viewing the task as a threat. So literally when you are procrastinating something that you don't like to do, your brain is seeing it as an actual threat. So you literally have stress and literal aversion to it. You have actual emotional reactions to it. And so instead of feeling that way, now you're actually moving towards something that is motivating, rewarding, and giving you a dopamine release in your brain, and it can change everything. And so I just think that when we first and foremost, whether we use that actual phrase or not, for me, um, I just think it's about the journey of understanding procrastination so that we can actually ultimately overcome it because it's all about what we know so that we can do 
with something now that we know something, right? I always say, now that you know something new, you can actually do something about it. Because if we're constantly subscribing to an idea that we just have to get better at time management, but it's not solving any of our procrastination problems, not only are we not gonna stop procrastinating, but we're also gonna beat ourselves up because now we think we're bad at time management too, which is actually not even the truth. And so as we continue to just try to understand things, I think that's the biggest thing. Then we can be aware of our own, like, self-reinforcing nature. I always say to people, we self-sabotage in little ways throughout our day more than we ever even know because so much of our activities and our actions are subconscious and we don't even realize that we're actually doing them. And so the key is consistency. So the more you practice a strategy like this, I think like anything, the more automatic it will, autom you know, it will start to become, which I think is interesting. A couple of my coaching clients have said, that they're actually now like noticing how many things they actually have an aversion to, um, that they're like finding them saying, saying out loud, this is the good work, like multiple times a day. And they're like, wow, apparently I think a lot of things in my business are a threat. Apparently my brain is not liking a lot of the things that I have to do. And so no wonder I don't have consistency in all of these areas of my business. No wonder I avoid a lot of things and I find other things to come into my day so that I don't have to do those. And now I don't have to do that anymore. And I actually just have an understanding of how my brain works so I can move past it. And, and that's when you can start really embracing productivity. You can't embrace productivity until you move past procrastination. Um, there is a... Um, a training that I saw online. I haven't taken it yet, but if anybody's curious, I always like to uh, bring some kind of action item. And I think there's some um, other short videos about this, but the program is actually called Overcoming Procrastination, Harnessing Neuro Boost Productivity. I actually had somebody that um, did the training and said it was like profound for them, but they really, really struggled with getting themselves into any consistent action. So this was an area in their life they really, really needed to work on. Um, so if anybody who happens to watch this now or later, finds himself in that same mode. Um, I just wanted to give you guys the research. Um, so what questions or what thoughts about procrastination do you guys have? We can just make it a little bit more um, interactive and talking about practical strategies, but I would love to hear if anybody feels like, okay, I have a sense of relief here. I'm not as bad at time management as I thought I was. Maybe there's something else going on. Absolutely. And I feel like this is just going back to the basics of your natural fight or flight instinct mm -hmm. of like something is a threat. Yes. It is this discomfort. How can I avoid this? How can I get away from the pain? Mm -hmm. I will, I will Canva. Mine is actually opposite. Mine is not, I, I forgot. <laughs> You're like, I don't want to ever do Canva. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I absolutely understand that. And I'm curious about some healthy reward examples that don't cost us money. Yes. <laughs> and don't make us gain weight. <laughs> yeah, chocolate would be a great one. I know. <laughs> That's my natural one. Because it got me thinking when you were talking about that, I'm like, what can I do? I can walk, I can go outside, I can do things like that. But what am I really looking forward to? And I had trouble imagining what that might be. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody have any ideas? That's a good question. You know, I've had people say that they love to like go to lunch or, you know, go to a coffee with friends, but they just don't find that they have, or like a colleague, they don't ever have time to do that because, you know, we're moms, we've got lives, we've got businesses. And it's like, we very, very rarely find time to do things like that. So I thought, you know, what if you spent, um, you know, a certain day of the week where you were really honing in on the things you don't like to do, probably lead generation, probably cold, call, whatever. I mean, that's the number one thing people don't like, but everybody can be different, but you really had like on Wednesdays or, you know, whatever I do this. And then I have a scheduled like lunch with the ladies and whoever can show up that day, because I really look forward to that. And that's something, you know, pedicures, yes, it costs money, but if you're going to do it anyway, you know, just try to, the things that you do that you enjoy already, just maybe try to attach them after you do something you don't like, you know what I mean? Think about your calendar a little bit differently. Well, I won't go and do the lunch with ladies or my coffee with my friends until I do, because that's the good work. I need to do it. And then I can go and enjoy and unplug and feel accomplished. So sometimes it's just like almost reworking your schedule a little bit. You see what I'm saying to intertwine the things you don't want to do and the things you like. And it goes a lot along with personal work on healing your inner child and becoming your mom to yourself, because in your business, you also have to be the boss of yourself. Yes. And there is this separate entity that needs to manage you. Mm -hmm. 
And so, so you kind of- that's really, really good. So I tell people that my bot, my boss is my calendar and it has been for 15 years. Like it, if, if I, I follow my calendar to the T that doesn't mean I don't procrastinate. Cause the reality is I can still not put the things I don't like to do in my calendar. Cause ultimately I'm the boss of myself via my calendar. Cause I'm putting the stuff on it. But the reality is, is that I put all my personal, like my top priorities, my relationship priorities, my health priorities, um, my spiritual growth priorities and my work priorities are all on my calendar. If they aren't on my calendar, I don't do them because I've trained myself so heavily to follow my calendar. Therefore, my calendar has become my boss. And now if I can start to put on my calendar the good work that is the lead generation, that is the whatever, and that is my boss, and I do follow my boss's instructions, but I do get to into anticipation of a reward after it, I can get myself to go through that in order to have something right after that I really enjoy. You can now actually use your brain to kind of motivate yourself to do something thing and create, you know, some of that dopamine and that just response that makes you feel good. And so that's where you could really use your calendar in a positive way to figure out how do I put these things together to keep myself productive and also enjoying the things that I like. I love it. And do you also put on your calendar time to respond to people that are dinging you and binging you during the time that you're not available? Yeah, I would say I always put breaks in between all of my calendar. For the most part, there are exceptions where I have something back to back occasionally if somebody if I'm using somebody else's, you know, schedule like a call like this, because I can't, it's a preset call and it might not fit perfectly in my calendar. But at the end of the day, if I'm creating my calendar, um, I always have a break in between them. I have a break for me to get up and walk around to get out in nature for 10 minutes if I need to. Oftentimes I'll go outside and that's where I'll respond to calls or text messages because I just really like being outside, Um, especially, you know, in the summer, but I I, I like it all the time. I think fresh air and nature, there's a whole bunch of science around that too. That could actually really, really do a lot of great things for you. So for me, I know I always have time between anything where I can check on things, I can reply, but I put myself in a space that I like. And that is a big, that has made a big difference for me. I don't just sit at my computer and then go right back into replying to all these people, calling all these people. No, I get up, I move around, I get outside, I take some deep breaths, I relax a little bit, I transition from whatever I was just doing. And then while I'm in nature or a space that I enjoy, I do my follow-up or my responding back. That has been very helpful for me. I love that. Does anyone else have a question or want to add anything to Carrie? Carrie's ideas? There's a lot of value there. It just totally flipped my perspective on this. Honestly, I've been coaching people for 15 years and I never actually thought of procrastination as a mood regulation. And the second I read that, I was like, of course it is. I just never thought of it like that. But it's something we talk about all the time that people move away from pain and towards pleasure. And we're training ourselves just like we're practicing doing anything else. And this is a practice that we not only need to use in our business, but also in our personal lives Mm -hmm. and how we respond to other people, how we notice when we're triggered, how we notice our emotional responses in any situation in life. It's important to be responsible for ourselves and to respond. Yeah. And I think it's just one of those things where we hear other people talking about procrastination. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner, you've had a coach or you've listened to YouTube or, you know, I mean, we've all read books and it's like procrastination historically has really been talked about. Like you just need to get better at priority management. You just have to get better at time management. That has really been in the last 10 years, kind of a very common thing. Procrastination is a huge topic in the coaching industry because everybody procrastinates. (laughs) And if we could just get ourselves to do what we need to do, we'd all make all the money we need to make. I mean, truthfully, right? It's that simple, but it's not easy. And so what we just need, I think the idea behind this is to just really understand what we are actually doing when we're procrastinating. Because anytime you can become aware of something, now you can make an active choice and you can make a change. Before, if you're trying to solve a problem, that's not the right solution. It's not going to help you, you know? And unfortunately people do that all the time. And then it just compounds the problem because now they feel bad about themselves for another reason. You know, it's like, gosh, I'm a procrastinator and I don't know how to time manage. I really suck. It's like, no, it's none of that. And also it's not you, it's just your brain and it's how your brain works. So when you can take that personal part of it out of the equation, you don't have to feel bad. You just have to figure out how to manage it because it just is what it is. 
Yes. And to soothe it and to say, Hey, thank you so much for trying to protect me yeah. during trying to do like a really difficult task. I've got it now. Yeah. You know? I can do this. I can do this now. Um, yeah. wow. Yeah. It's really yeah. great. I know you have to run. It is three 33. So does anyone have a question for Carrie before she, uh, heads off Lauren, Kristen? No. Awesome. Well, it's nice to see you guys. I hope it was helpful. If you guys uh, ever want me to come back and talk about a specific topic, Beth knows where to find me and I love doing it. Um, also, if anybody has an interest in just like picking my brain about anything, I always tell people you can just reach out to me um, and I'm happy to do a 15 minute call or 20 minute call and there's no obligation or any pressure about anything other than just a quick coaching conversation. If there's something you're stuck on that I can maybe help move you through or give you a resource and you can uh, easily find that on just going to levelupwithcarry.com and then you can just schedule a 30 minute call and we'll chat. So uh, I just wanted to offer that to your people, Beth, because I do that anytime I do a podcast or anything. Thank you for having me on. Congratulations on this awesome collaborative group. You guys, if you continue to help each other, you're all going to rise to the top. There's absolutely zero doubt of that. And I think it's an awesome movement. So I'm proud of you. Yay. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks so much for your time. We'll talk you're soon. You're welcome. See you guys later. Have a great week. Bye.